Hey everybody, today Rado previews a prototype of Tungaru, but before I get going, please turn your subtitles on to the Klingon channel so that when I make rules goose you'll know what they are. And if you've done that, then welcome to the beautiful archipelago of Tungaru, where each player controls their own tribe. Uh, but our tribe is not enough. We are trying to recruit various nomads who are constantly immigrating into this area because they all bring sage wisdom and special abilities that will help us earn as many victory points as possible. And I've got the game set up here as a two-player. I'm green, Jen is blue. And before we get going, the last player gets to pick one of the locations for their worker skiff. And Jen has already chosen this area over here. And the reason for that is this gives her access to these two islands. And she likes these two islands because there's a nomad here that if Jen can recruit will give her control of her dice. Plus one or minus one to every die for the rest of the game. Which is a pretty big deal. Uh, but also, hey, this nice lady will give her one free fish. She's a master fisherwoman uh, for the rest of the game. So, Jen is sitting pretty, having access to these. After she chose, me as the first player, I chose my spot, I went right here. So I also have access to Fisher Lady, and I've got access to this guy, who makes it cheaper and easier to deploy my settlers, which I might do later on. Okay, so uh, that's out of the way, and now the game can begin. The first thing that happens every round is the first player rolls their dice... Let's see, and we got a two, a six, and a six. If it had been three of a kind, I would have had to re-roll. So a two, six, six. And that's not just my dice, that's everybody's dice. Jen also sets herself to two, six, and six. And if anybody had a uh, nomad, an immigrant, who gave free income, like free fish or shells or whatever, they would get that income now. Now, at the beginning of the game, of course, we haven't recruited any nomads yet, so the income doesn't happen. We've done the dice rolling, and now we go on to the next phase, which is where each of us chooses a leader. At the beginning of the game, we have access to the exact same deck of five leadership cards, and each of us is going to choose one in secret and reveal at the same time. So, these cards give us access to a lot of stuff. If I choose the worker, I will get a fourth die. I won't just have three dice this round. I'll have four, so I'll get to do more stuff. Also, I'll have the one-time benefit of doing a double harvest instead of just a single. And if I have fives on my dice, I can get pearls. And if I have ones or sixes, I can get, oh, what do you call it? Uh, shells. So, that's if I recruit the worker, or if I uh, bring my worker leader. I could bring out the beggar, though. His special ability is I would immediately get to beg from Jen and take one of her resources. And she, at least, would get three victory points to make up for the loss. And if I was playing with more than two players, I would beg from the player to my left and my right, so I could get a lot of stuff. Although, other players who decided to beg, they are immune. And also, players who play their chief card, Card number five are safe as well. So, also, the beggar, even more important than the free resources, when you recruit one time in a round, you get a discount of one good. So it's cheaper and easier to recruit characters. Let's move on to character number three, the fisherwoman, who gives you a free fish. Just boom, straight out. Uh, extra fish is always a good thing. And you can one time move for free. You don't have to spend your dice like normal. And fives can get double shells. Our, our ones and fours can get coconuts. Then we've got the trader, who is uh, has a special power. Uh, once per turn, any one good can stand in for anything. It can be a wild card. A fish can be a pearl, a coconut can be a shell, whatever. And you get one free tr bonus trade action. So that's, again, like an extra action, and it can be done anywhere on the map. Normally, if you want to trade shells for pearls or coconuts for fish, you have to have your boat over by that island. But with the trader, you don't. You could be on one side of the island and do trade on the other side. And then finally, I already mentioned the chief. And what she does is, well, she determines who's going to have first player going into the next round. And also, she has the power of maneuvering, manipulating the nomads. If I were all the way down here and I wanted to recruit this nomad, rather than sailing all the way up there, I might just have the chief bring this nomad down to me by doing a swaparoo. Plus, the chief can bring two fish or a pearl um, with ones, fours, or sixes. All right, so I got to pick, and Jen it simultaneously will pick as well. 
And, um, I mean, you know what? It's, it's never a bad idea. Never a bad idea to just get, uh, just play my worker. Get an extra action. I'll be able to do four actions instead of three because every die is an action I can do over the course of a round. And I'd be able to harvest some more stuff. What can I harvest? Well, with a th with a, a three, four, five, or six, I can get fish over here. With a four, five, or six, I can get coconuts over there. You know what? Yeah. Ha, ha, who, who's going to say no to a free bonus action? It's like I get an extra worker for free. So that's what I'm going to choose. Jen, meanwhile, she's got the exact same cards as me. She's got to pick one. And she will. she's made her choice. Okay. And now everybody reveals at the same time, I'm working. And Jen is begging. She's going to beg for me. No. Okay. So I got to deal with that. But we resolve these in order. First, everybody who uh, tried to get a worker, they all get their extra dice. Then everybody who begs gets to beg. And then everybody who uh, does fishing gets to fish, etc., etc. So I get four dice. And while Jen is stuck with her two, six, and six, I also get another two. Okay. And so we're done with the workers. Now Jen is going to beg. And... She on um, beg, and since I did not play a beggar myself, nor did I play the chief, nor am I out of resources. Everybody starts with one of each of the four resources at the beginning of the game. So I am susceptible to being begged. I get to choose what Jen is going to take, and hey, this should have been over here. I do get one, two, three victory points. You can see I started. This is my second attempt. Uh, Jen begged last time too, so she's continuing to beg. All right, so I got to give her something. And here's the thing. I don't want to give her a fish or a pearl because I need those to recruit Fishing Lady here. And I don't want to give her coconuts either because if I harvest fish from over here, remember, my worker is going to let me do a double harvest, which means I'll get two fish from one die, and then I'll have the two fish and a coconut to recruit this guy as well. So I'll have two nomads right from the get-go. So, well, that means... If I'm trying to hold on to my fish and my pearl and my coconut, I'm going to give Jen a shell. All right, and now Jen is full. She cannot hold any more stuff until she gives herself more resources or more storage capacity. All right, so Jen is done begging. And then, like I said, if there were any other players who had played their fishers or their traders or their chiefs, well, the chiefs don't get resolved until the end of the round when uh, a new player, a new chief is crowned and gets the first player marker. All right, so we are done with that. Now, the main portion of gameplay can begin. In player order, we are each going to take turns using one of our dice to interact with the islands that are next to us, or we could also use our dice to sail all over the place to get access to different islands. Now, there are actually six basic actions we can do. They're all listed here on our player boards. I'm just going to bring one closer so you can see what they are. We can boat which means we can spend a die to move. It, any die we want, we can spend to move up to three spaces. Although if we move that third space, it's going to cost them some fish. So normally you only move two. We can harvest, which means we have to spend a die equal to the value of the island we're at, and then we get a resource. Although remember, because I've got the worker, I can do a double harvest once this round. Then we can settle, which means we deploy our little settlers out on the board. And these basically count as extra dice. It's like we have a permanent die on the board on a given island that we can activate for the rest of the game without having to spend our dice. And let's see, we can trade, which every island has a different trade opportunity. Like, uh, you know, this island over here, I could give up a shell if I had one for a pearl, uh, or I could give up a shell for coconuts. I gave up my shell, so I can't do trade at either of these islands right now. Jen, meanwhile, she could turn her pearl that she started with into two shells if she needed to. So, uh, but again, you can only do trade at one of the two islands you can actually reach that you're adjacent to. And now there's another interesting thing. You can either use a die to engage in trade, or you can use one of your settlers. Remember, these settlers are basically characters we can put on the board who act as dice um, for the rest of the game and allow us to get access to the travel, build, and trade actions without having to spend our precious dice. So it's like a permanent worker. 
Right. Travel is all about moving a settler from one island to another. Because the problem is, if I put one of my settlers over here on this island, hey, I get actions I can do here without having to spend my dice. If I then sail away, well, the travel action allows me to have my settlers move to an adjacent island. So, that's where I was. That is what the travel action is. And finally, the build action is actually misnamed. It's actually recruit. I have a prototype now. Some things are a little out of date, etc., um, etc. Cetera, et cetera. But um, building means I can spend a die or one of my settlers to basically recruit a nomad and give myself access to powers and to victory points. And that is the first thing I am going to do. I am going to recruit Fisher Girl before Jen does because we both have access to this island. So I can use any of my four dice. And let's see, I've got these twos. And unfortunately, my twos can't let me get um, pearls or shells. And also, my twos can't harvest off of either of these islands. So those twos are a little bit less useful. So I'm going to go on ahead and spend a two as my first action to build. Or I'm sorry, to recruit. I'm going to recruit from this island and grab uh, my dream girl here. So I have to give up a fish and a pearl, which I still have. Fish and Pearl, and I will go on ahead and slot her in here. And now, at the beginning of every round for the rest of the game, I get a fish for free. And also, at the end of the game, I get four points for every settler I have deployed. I've got three, so by the end of the game, you better believe I want all three of my settlers on the board, because that'll be 12 points I've got coming my way. These nomads are you're really your only source of scoring points for the course of the game. So I have recruited her. Okay, and what is interesting now is there is an empty spot. And you will notice, as part of setup, each one of the main islands we can interact with, or each one of these islands, had a nomad waiting to be recruited. But then there are all these other nomads on these satellite islands. What happens is, when there's an opening, I now get to choose. Does this nomad come in waiting to be recruited? Or does this nomad? Because I'm giving Jen access to this character or this character. But I'm also giving access to myself. Um, let's see. I will go on ahead and I guess I'll bring her in. There we go. Okay, I'm going to bring her in. Her special ability is she gives me two more storage. Remember, at the beginning of the game, we only have a finite amount of storage for all our stuff. If you recruit this nomad, you've got two extra storage for the rest of the game. Plus, she gives two points for every mo uh, monument you've built by the end of the game. What's a monument, you say? Well, that's another important part of recruiting. When you recruit, if you have not built a monument yet on that island, you get to build one immediately. So, and you can see there's only uh, three spots. I get to build a monument here. And as part of setup, I've got monument potential covering a lot of different things. If I build this monument for when I recruited her, I give myself more storage. If I build this monument or this monument, I give myself another slot that I can put more nomads in so I can have more active nomads. If I build this one, I have to build from the top and work my way down, I get nothing. But then if I build this one, I get a fish and then nothing. And then if I build this one, my fourth monument can be a free coconut and then a free shell so I can get free resources off of those. So which one do I want? You know what? Since I'm going to be getting free fish, I'm going to go on ahead and build this monument to give myself access to more storage. Right. Okay, so that was my first of four actions. I have recruited her, and now I'm going to be getting free fish, and I want to start chasing after that. And I've given myself more storage potential as well. Oh, and, and, and. I, one of the dice worker placement spots has been gobbled up here. So two more dice could come here to um, recruit this person or to harvest some coconuts, etc., etc. All righty. So or or engage in trade, which are basically the three things you can do on a given island. My first turn is done. It is now Jen's turn, and I think she's going to do the exact same thing. She's going to do a recruitment. Uh, to get this one, because she wanted that right from the get-go. And the interesting thing is, she'll be able to control her dice for the rest of the game, and she will get four points for every recruit 
that gives more storage space. Oh my gosh, I wasn't even thinking about that. By me slipping this in here, I've created a character that Jen definitely wants, because I know she's going to recruit this guy. And then that means if she gets her, uh, she'll get four points because this is a storage one, and this gives you four points for every storage nomad. Maybe I should have slipped this one in instead. Now, either way, whichever one I slip in, I forgot. Uh, out here at the Satellite Island, a new one immediately gets revealed. So another storage person is in the queue. Oh, Jen's going to be very happy because, hey, there's storage people in the queue. And there's another one over here. So Jen could, after having him and getting control of her dice, she could spend the rest of the game trying to recruit all these other storage ones so they can translate into more points. Urgh. All right. Well... Let's see, I didn't necessarily want her, so I gave her access to this one instead, but then another storage person came in anyway. So, that was the end of my turn. I've done my worker placement. I did a recruiting. I now want to get my um, my people deployed. It is Jen's turn. She is going to recruit as well. She has a two, a six, and a six. She's got to spend one of them up here. And she needs two shells. And the interesting thing is, Jen originally, she started with only one shell, which is why she had the beggar, because the beggar was going to give her a discount. She'd only have to pay one instead of two shells. But surprise, 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 that begging paid off because I gave her an extra shell. So she could save this recruiter for somebody else. And I think that's what she's going to do. I do, I do indeed. Jen will spend two shells uh, and she will spend her, she'll spend her, her two. Because uh, again, it could be any value, as we're reminded right here, any value you want for um, recruiting. Jen's going to spend her two to recruit this fella. And, um, right, so that happened. And now, this one slides in. So I couldn't keep Jen from getting access to those. And this uh, person comes out in the queue waiting to find a home on an island. And what her special power is, she lets you convert pearls into points directly. 10 points per pearl. And you can use any value die that you want. So that's pretty cool. Okay, so that was Jen's first action. She has done a recruit. And she's going to want to recruit again, I think. And uh, yeah, so, uh, but... It is now my second turn, and I've got a few more actions I want to do. Now, I think, yes, okay, I am going to harvest, and I have a choice. I can harvest this island or this island. Here I need threes to sixes to get fish. Here I need fours to sixes to get coconuts. So fish are a little bit more plentiful. And the interesting thing is right now I want fish because I need two fish to recruit this fella. So I am going to spend one of my sixes to get, normally it would be one fish, but because of my worker, one time, I can use this power, and you're supposed to tap afterwards, indicate you've used it. I'm going to get two fish. Boom, boom. Bippity bop. Okay. And uh, that is that. And now I've got the coconut and the two fish to be able to recruit this guy, uh, which I'm probably going to do next. Uh, but we'll come back to me in a second. And now it is Jen's turn. And Jen says, hey, I... Ha Jen has no more shells, but she will now use the power of her beggar to uh, require costs one less. Jen will recruit this, spending only a pearl, no shell. She started with a pearl, and Jen has done her second recruitment, um, which gives her more storage space. Oh, Jen had to pay a die for this, so there we go. Uh, gives her more storage space. Although, Jen is running out of places. She only has one more place to put... Oh, whoops, I forgot, I forgot! Folks, this is why you always watch the thing on subtitles turned on. Paolo already noted that Jen, of course, when she recruited her first time, she got to put a monument out. Let's say she knew she was going to get more storage, so she didn't have to do that. Let's say she wanted to start getting more resources, so she did this one. Okay. So now she builds another monument. She'll get a resource for free. All right. And since she's got so much storage space, that's not a bad thing to chase after. All right. So Jen has done her second recruitment. And now here's the problem. Jen would like to put another monument out, but Jen has already put a monument here. You can only place one monument on an island. You can keep recruiting from that island, but you can only place one monument until you've put a monument on every island. Once all the islands have a monument, then you can start putting additional monuments down. And since there are ultimately, was it eight, I think? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There are eight monuments to put into play. Um, you will have to sail around quite a bit to get these monuments built. Now, you may or may not want to do that. It really depends on whether you get, say, this fella, 
who gives you two points for every monument you've built over the course of the game. So if you recruit this nomad, not only does he let you sell fish for points, but he will give you two points. And so you'll want to get all um, all of your monuments built, because that means he'll be worth 16 points, plus five for um, every fish you sell through him for the rest of the game. That's interesting. Anyway, though. So, uh, Jen has done her second. She can't put another monument here, so she doesn't unlock anything else. But she does get more storage. And Jen what, does want to start building monuments, because she's got one of these. And now, either this nomad or this nomad comes in. Remember, Jen gets four points for every storage-based nomad. So Jen will have this fella slide on in. A new one becomes available, and this lady gives us free coconuts every round for the rest of the game. And her scoring thing is, well, some of them uh, have uh, flowers, and you get. Uh, uh, she is a set collection for getting more unique flowers off of different ones. Are there any other ones out right now? Yes, there is. So this one is three, this one is one, so you could go for a set collection thing, uh, depending on how you recruit. So Jen is just recruited again, but sadly she didn't get to put another monument out. Okay, so that was Jen's second turn. It is now my third turn, and so I will go ahead and um, recruit this guy. I believe. And that'll be interesting. Yes. So, yeah, it's going to cost me full one, two, the two fish I got plus the coconut. And the nice thing is, hey, uh, he's on a new island, so I get to put another monument down. Let's go on ahead and put one of these down so I've got more slots for more nomads. Boom! Okay, I recruit him. I'll put him in this brand new slot I just made for myself. And now, just like Jen, I want to collect these types of characters that give me storage potential because they're worth four points to me. Jen would have liked to recruit him because they stack. Uh, if Jen had both of these at the end of the game, she would get eight points for every storage uh, type character. So anyway, so I've recruited him. And his special power is an interesting one. He immediately says, put one of my... Um, what do you call it? Settlers on here. And now, on a future turn, I can deploy this settler without having to spend dice like normal. I get a free deploy. And it's only half price. Normally, to deploy a settler, as you're reminded on your board, to uh, settle... Where is it? You need to spend two fish and a die at an island that you're located. But... This guy says, as a one-time thing, I'll get to deploy this settler for only one fish and no die. I mean, heck, if I had any more fish, I could do it right now. And now that means I would get more activations on this island. Or this island, if I wanted. But unfortunately, I don't have any fish. I'm out. But I'll start getting some income soon. Alrighty. And so, that is cleared out. Uh, and now, either this uh, nomad or this nomad moves in. And... This is the Nomad I'm interested in. Remember, I'm getting free fish for the rest of the game. This guy lets me convert fish into points. So I'm going to let this slip on in here. And then another one comes out. And this is another free fish. I could get two free fish every turn and convert two fish into ten points. Uh, so you can, I can start making a little fish combo engine while still trying to do other stuff. All right. So, that was uh, my third action. Looking good so far. Although now, I'm completely out of resources. It is Jen's last action. She's got a six. She still has um, coconuts. She would like to recruit this person, but she needs a pearl. She doesn't have any pearls. She, to recruit him, she is either going to need to beg to get the discount in the future, or she's going to need to get a pearl. Where can she get pearls, you might ask? Well, it just so happens... They're all the way over here on the other side of the world. If you roll a 1 or a 2 and you're adjacent to this island, you can go pearl diving and get a pearl. Pearls are the rarest, toughest thing to get. There's only one place and you need to roll 1s or 2s. Yikes. Although, there is another option. Remember, Jen, in a future turn, could play the trader, which means anything could stand as a wild to get a pearl. Okay, so with that in mind, I think... Jen's last action, Jen, uh, she could move. She could spend this die to move um, one, two. So she could start sailing over here. Or if she wanted to spend this fish, she could spend one, two, three, get all the way over here, and then die for pearls next round. But Jen doesn't plan on doing that. Jen will just spend this last die to harvest a coconut. So now Jen has two coconuts and a fish. And she is done. Um, but I have one more turn. How is that? What have I not done? 
Oh, whoops. I didn't put a die over here, right? Yes. Because I, I forgot to put a die when I recruited. It's because I recruited and I harvested over here. Right. So it is my last turn. I have no resources. I've used my special power. I've still got a six. I could use that six wherever I am to get a shell. Or I could use this six over here to get a coconut. Or I could use this six over here to get a fish. Um, or I could use this six. Remember, I do need fish. Oh. I could. If I use this six, the last space here, to get a fish, I would then have the fish. I could immediately deploy this guy, which is worth four points to me, and I could set myself up to do more bonus actions. But here's the thing. Remember, both Jen and I are trying to recruit nomads who are extra storage because we get four points for them. I think I'm going to make my move. My last die is going to be to go sailing. Right. Where did that die go? It was a six. I totally lost track of it. Oh, right. I was thinking, no, I'm not going to. I am going to sail. And I can move up to three spaces. I'm going to, you know, which is say cross uh, the dotted lines. I'm going to move twice. One. And then I can go here or here. That gives me access to these islands or these islands. I think I'll come here because I want to recruit him because he's worth four points for more storage. I want to recruit him because the fish that I'm auto-generating, I want to convert into points. All righty. Although, if I recruit him, I don't get to put another monument out, whereas I do get to put a monument up there. So anyway, so I've moved to with that last die I had, and I am in position for the future. And I put that die over here, and that means I can only move once per turn, because I've now blocked that worker placement spot. Phew! That seemed like a lot, didn't it, folks? And yet, that was only the first round. Okay, at the end of the round, if anybody had uh, chosen the chief, which gave them different abilities and whatnot, they would then become the first player. If multiple players chose to be the chief, it would be whoever was the last player in turn order becomes a new first player. Nobody chose chief, so I am still holding on to first place, and we are ready to go into round two, which means, once again, we will have to roll our dice, choose a worker and all of that, and, let's see, once our... Uh, all four, right. I'm trying to remember. I know there's one thing we do, which is we trade cards. But I feel like there's something else. Oh yeah, yeah. We just right, okay. Yeah, we get our dice back. Bippity boppity boop. Our dice back. And um, although not this one, because that came from the worker. And if we had put, if I had put one of my settlers out here, and I had used him to get access to the ability of this island, I would have knocked him down because I can only use him once per turn. But he would stand back up again, ready to go. So anyway, you stand them back up, you get your dice back, and here's the most important thing, folks. Remember at the beginning, I played a worker, Jen played a trader. We swap. Everybody ends up handing um, the card they played to the next player. And so I now have two beggars. Jen has two workers. Jen cannot beg anymore. I cannot work anymore. Okay. And we start the new round where, hey, folks, I get some free fish. Free fish! Boom. And what else do I get? Uh, all right, and uh, there's no other income. I'm still the first player, so I roll them bones. It's a one, a four, and a six, which means Jen has a one, a four, and a six as well, although Jen has a lot more control over those dice than me because of Mr. Die Man there. And uh, we now, once again, pick one of our leaders. And who am I going to pick? I definitely, I mean, Jen could rush over here and recruit this right out from underneath me. Should I have gone over there? Should I? Well, from here, I could have gone one, two, and I could have been up here instead. I'm the first player. And here's the thing. No, my problem is I need a coconut and a pearl to get him. I don't have either of those. So even if I begged, I wouldn't be able to... to although I could. If I begged, I'd be able... Well, you know what? Jen would be smart. If I begged, Jen would give me a fish, which means I'd have two fish. Uh, and because she gave me a coconut, then if I'm begging, I could beg for the pearl. So, yeah, Jen would give me the fish. She wouldn't give me the coconut. If I begged, I'd get a fish, which wouldn't help me. Um, so, let's see. Should I rush over there to recruit this one before that one? But the thing is, my whole fish thing, I really want to get this guy. Plus, I want to get her. Um, you know, Because after I recruit them, she comes in. I'm making double fish every turn. And then when I recruit him, I'm turning those fish into points hand over fish. 
So, I could have chased after here, so we could have been in a race, because I can see Jen has the coconut she needs, but she doesn't. Well, no, no. I know what Jen would do is, she'll probably play the trader, because then she could turn this fish into the pearl she needs. So, there's no way I'm going to be able to recruit that before her. So, it was the right thing to come over here. Jen is going to play the trader, so she can recruit that. Although, she keeps recruiting from the same island. She's not getting more um, monuments built, which means she's not unlocking more stuff on her board. Me... I want to recruit both of these, and I need pearls, coconuts, and shells. I get pearls over here, and look, we got a one. I know we've got a one. I make this choice knowing what dice I'm going to have. So I'm going to be able to get a pearl over here, and I could get a fish over here, but I can't get a shell. So I'm going to need a shell. So I could do the beggar. Same as Jen. Snag something from her, she gets points. And then I can get him, and I can get the discount on the recruit. Or, yeah, I'm going to play a beg. Jen begged for me, I'm going to beg right back. We reveal, and Jen says, All right, is she going to give me the fish or the coconut? Because here's the thing. She wants to hold on to these coconut because she noticed she could recruit this guy that converts coconuts into 10 points. Although he's a bit tougher. You need a 4, 5, or 6 to activate him. Whereas the fish salesman only gets five points for a fish, but you can use any die you want. Hmm. I think Jen wants to hold on to her a lovely bunch of coconuts because she wants to recruit him. So Jen will give me the fish. She got three points for my begging. And now Jen says, hey, I'm a trader. She immediately gets to do a trade. She can um, activate any trade action she wants anywhere, which could be coconut and two fish or... Coconut. Although, I mean, she has this power, so... Yeah, but I mean, she wouldn't, she wouldn't noise that. So it's just coconut into two fish. Does she want to do that? She just gave up a fish. She does need fish to recruit this guy. So yeah, she will convert, doing this trade action, a coconut into two fish. Boom, boom. Okay. And so she, Jen's done her action. I've done my action. And now the worker placement begins again. And the first thing I do is I go pearl diving to get that pearl. And Jen says, I use this to say one of these fish is a wild card. And then she uses her other coconut. And that gives her what she needs to recruit him. And Jen now has even more storage. And she gets five points for every settler she's put out. And she will have coconut generating person come in and then another one comes out so now she can start generating coconuts she still wanted to sell canoe because there's that another die manipulator comes into the queue and jen does not get to put another monolith because she's just you know focusing there and meanwhile me i will now use my discount from my trader to spend that pearl plus nothing else to recruit this guy i now have more storage and i get a point for every nomad i recruit whether they are active or not. Because the interesting thing is, I've only got so many slots I can use for active nomads, but when I recruit a nomad, I can always just take them face down to score points at the end of the game. So I want to recruit nomads like crazy to make this worth more points. Plus, I've got more storage. Plus, that was worth four points off of this. So that was all very, very nice. And I have now put out yet another uh, monolith. So now I've got two more active I can have here. And... Uh, fish generating lady comes in. That's exactly what I wanted. And then, so I generate fish, I sell fish, uh, and I've got a lot more options. A new one comes out, and it's another one of these that allows me to immediately... And you know what? I could, if I want to, uh, before my turn is over, because this guy's here, I could have gone on ahead and spent this fish and deployed him immediately over... over here, let's say. And now... That means I can use him without having to spend a die to um, convert shells into coconuts or to recruit or to move to, I mean, move him to a different location. That doesn't help me right now. Do I want to do this one? Maybe so. That might make more sense because I can convert a fish into a coconut because I need a coconut over here. But I can't get the other pearl I need and I've already used my begging so I can't because I, I got these high numbers, and I can't change them to low numbers like Jen can. So, anyway, uh, but I, I've got my first one of these in deployed, which is four points as well, which is going to give me another action on this island. Although, uh, oh, yes! No, no, that's right. They cannot be used for harvesting. You have to use dice to harvest, unfortunately. 
Um, but still, I mean, I could use this. Oh, I need two fish. Can I get two fish? Um, oh, that's interesting. If I turn my one fish into coconut, then if I uh, I can convert a coconut into two fish, but that's still not the three fish I need, etc., etc. But anyway, I've got my first person. That's going to be another action I can do this turn. Uh, but anyway, then it's Jen's turn. She's going to do something. I don't know what because I've kind of lost track. But folks, I think I'm going to stop right there because that should give you a pretty good idea of what Tungaru is all about. And um, before I go into final thoughts here... Please remember, this was a paid preview of this prototype. So you should take any subjective opinions I've got about the game with a grain of salt. Decide for yourself. Use the run-through to decide if it looks like fun to you. Go check out the Kickstarter page to learn more about the game. But anyway, what did Jen and I think about our time with this game? Well, this is from the design team of Stefan and Louis Maltz. They are a father-son German designer. And I've been watching them ever since Edo. These are very sharp designers. Although maybe they're better known for Rococo. And um, you know they have been putting out solid game after solid game after solid game. They're kind of flying under the radar. They haven't quite made you know the same big splash as um, you know uh, Dunstan and Gilbert or Kramer and Kiesling or something like that. And yet they just keep putting out really sharp designs. And this is no exception. Um, you know, their games always feature some core really interesting mechanism. And I think probably the most interesting element about this game is the fact that... Well, there's two really cool elements. One is I use my leader and then I lose my leader. And I might not see this leader again for a while. But I'm going to get... It's going to be replaced with somebody else. That's an implicitly cool idea. Uh, you know, in fact, I've seen it... I mean, geez, just last month, uh, we had the same kind of idea in Cosmic Colonies, which, you know, I, I play a card because it's really powerful, but then that means I'm giving it to my opponent, and they know what, I, what they're going to have access to next round. Really cool. And it's a nice idea. I will say... That while I like it here, it's not quite as impactful as I'd like in a two-player game. Jen and I have found we often, oh, look, we both played Merchant. We just end up swapping stuff back and forth. I think that's going to work much better at a higher player count. It's going to be a lot more interesting as you see, man, I'm never going to see that beggar again while he slowly works his way all the way around the table before he ever gets back to me kind of a thing. Um, as opposed to, oh, yeah, I might use beggar and get him back immediately when there's only two players. But still, it's a cool idea. I like quite a bit. But what I'm even more impressed by is... Yeah, I didn't really expect it, but this game is kind of like a gamer's bingo sort of situation because everybody has access to the same dice every round. And what that means is, well, the dice we have helps us decide which is going to be the best leader. Because remember, not only can we put dice on the islands, we can put dice on our leaders as well. Oh, that's how I could have done it. Nope, I didn't. I, I needed a... My six could have gotten me another coconut. And then I could have come over here and turned that coconut into two more fish. And yes, I could do it. I could use my four to move over here. Or I was saying I couldn't do it. Use my four to move over here. And then use my um, six to get a coconut. But then I'm sure to die to be able to convert the coconut into the fish. Because my go other guy is standing ready to be able to allow me to recruit once I've got the three fish. And I want to do that so I can get more income faster. Oh, I'm so close. But anyway, so, um, you know, the, the cards are worker placement spots. They're cool special powers. Um, but I was saying, yeah, the worker placement spots um, give you more stuff you can do based on your dice. And everybody has access to the same dice. Which means... You can get into situations where, oh, we both rolled low. That means we both kind of want to get to those islands that, you know, we could take advantage of those low dice because we're not near an island that really be be benefits from high dice. And, um, you know, right from the get-go, after you roll the dice and get your income and everybody just, and, you, and you're thinking about what leader you're going to play, you are planning out your entire turn. Right, I'm going to do this, which is going to give me that, and that means I'm going to move over there so I can recruit that, and that'll give me this bonus, which I can immediately flip to do this other thing, and then this other one will come out, and I'll be in position for the next round, etc., etc. So there's actually a lot of planning that goes into every round, but of course, the best played plans can go awry, depending on what your opponent does if they end up grabbing that nomad right out from underneath you. And um, that is really... Really, really satisfying. Every round, it feels really, really good to try to figure, to make that plan, and then you know work through that plan and, and make it all come together, and then set up for the next day.
So, like that a lot. Like the dice worker placement. It's, it's really unique, sets itself apart, and the fact that everybody has access to the same dice um, really makes things interesting too uh, because it, it has so much impact in so many different areas. So I like that a lot. I like the trading of the leaders, although again, it could be better at higher player counts. Uh, speaking of higher player counts, obviously the beggar is going to be a lot more interesting when you've got a player to your left and your right to go fish. With all, in only the two-player game, the beggar felt a little anemic. It still works. I mean, hey, if I've only got one opponent, taking one resource from them just so they can get three points, that's a pretty big deal. But I had rather play the beggar and get a resource from both players to the left and the right, and that means it'd be trickier timing and all of that. Uh, the beggar would just become more powerful, the potential for more power in a higher-player game. And so that's kind of a bummer, too. Um, but... Uh, you know, those two-player niggles aside, I do think the core game here works really nice. It is a race. The game does speed up as we go because the ending is when there are no more nomads. All of the immigrants to this archipelago have found homes, basically. I have to say, I just really like the story of this game. A game that is pro-immigration and demonstrates how new people coming into your society can help out and, you know, allow everyone to thrive is a solid and wonderful message that is, uh, I think, well-received these days. So I love that, too. So, I mean, there's a lot we like here. In the end, one thing is, this is, for all intents and purposes, a large portion of this game is pick up and deliver. <gasps> oh, I gotta get over there with some fish. I'm over here, I'll grab the fish, I'll sail over there, I'll pick it up. You do spend a fair bit of time plotting out how to move, um, You know, sometimes making big moves. There are special powers that uh, le uh, let you effectively teleport anywhere on the board instantly. Um, the, what's it, the the trader, or no, it's not the trader, the fisher also lets you move around cheaply and quickly and easily as well. So, there is, th this is an interesting mix of games, and that's pretty much par for the course with the Maltzes. They really come up with very fresh combinations of mechanisms. So you've got bingo, plus dice worker placement, plus card drafting, or kind of reverse card drafting, plus pick up and deliver, um, and all this stuff combines into a really fun and interesting stew. I don't know if it's a keeper for me and Jen, because again, we really aren't that keen on pick up and deliver, when this is a not insignificant portion of the game, and the two player, man, I just, I, 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 you know, I, I, it's one of those things where I was wishing there was a dummy player. So the beggar would work in both directions. I mean, yeah, because that's actually what, interestingly, what uh, Cosmic Colonies did. To make the um, trading of cards more interesting, uh, you know, there were two virtual players that I don't, after I play my card, I don't immediately give to you. It goes to a virtual player that represents the next step. And then the round after that, it will go to you. So it emulated that higher player count. I guess I would have liked to see that here. But this is only a two player consideration. And don't get me wrong, the game still works great. I don't really have any faults to it whatsoever. I just find myself thinking, oh, but it'd be better with more. So that, plus the fact that it does have a sizable amount of pick up and deliver, not our favorite mechanism. Um, you know, it, 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 it's, it's, it, it's, it's a solid game. We really enjoyed it. But mostly, I just find myself looking forward to the next great uh, Lewis and Stefan Maltz game because these two continue to produce solid game after solid game. What's the other one they recently did? Oh, Valparaiso, another really sharp game. I'm just constantly impressed by this father and son team. And, um, you know, they have done a great job once again in Tungaru. And that is the preview, folks. Thanks very much for watching. Have a very nice day. Talk to you later. So long. Uh, bye bye